Hey, hello, howdy, how you doing? Welcome to the second installment of PZ Cribs. For those that don't know, I run two PZ servers, which house more than 3,500 players. At the end of each wipe, I dedicate a week or so to go through and tour the bases of those who would like to have their hard work showcased, with you, the audience, voting for the best base of that wipe. The winner receives a special role in Discord along with a golden hammer and a free shipment of material for their next build. You all ended up crowning Fu as the winner last go around, which means they're officially ineligible for this video. Because of that, I figured it'd be worth showcasing their base first to see what they've utilized their winnings on. Starting out near Crossroads, we took a short cruise to one of the larger projects in either server. Fu, as a single builder, had been working on a mini town just to the east of Crossroads named New Alexandria. The first building has a really cool design, but was never decorated as it was given to a friend who had stopped playing. In Fu's own words, it's just a big empty shell. The second building is the Mansion House. Not only does it have some of the rare vehicles sitting out on display, it also comes equipped with a library just inside the front door, housing every single book and recipe magazine in the game. Just inside the walkway is a little lounge area with a kitchen and living room set up for those who'd like to deep throw some pickles, chuck a couple Bud Lights, and watch A Bug's Life. The kitchen is also fully stocked with items from Saf's cooking mod for those interested in checking that out. Highly recommend it. In the garage, Fu kept a Hellcat along with some basic necessities including, but not limited to, a mannequin, Among Us cosplay suits, an M60, and a feather duster. The second floor is preserved for Fu's bedroom, consisting of some stolen art, an army of plushies, and a little zen garden. It's hard to see, but there's also a hidden compartment in the corner just below the golf clubs that's loaded with plonkies for those late night cravings. Heading out to the backyard, there's a massive pool along with some more vehicles hiding up behind the buildings. You're able to fish in the pool as well, so as long as you have access to a stick and a knife, you'll have an infinite food source. My favorite part of this setup was the absolutely massive 118 centimeter pipe just sitting next to the pool that I can only assume was caught just feet from where we stood. Next up was the famous weapon display room. If you remember from the pilot episode, Fu had managed to gather one of each weapon in the Brita's weapon pack. Well, they did it again. Everything from the 22 LR pistols, to M72 laws, miniguns, and grenade launchers. This is always one of my favorite things to see in people's bases, because believe it or not, a lot of work has to go into finding some of these weapons, not to mention the sheer number needed to complete the collection. In the wise words of the late great Billy Mays, but wait, there's more. Moving into the mechanic shop, Fu decorated the flooring with metal grates for the vehicles to sit on, a nice touch that I don't think many people would notice initially. The crates are all full of items you'd normally use for vehicle repair, along with some electronic equipment. I'm pretty sure this also doubles the general crafting area as well, judging from all the metalworking gear in the area. The final building in the town was the grocery store slash clothing store. There's a small little prop set up for a military vehicle with a supply crate placed near it, covered with general food and supplies which I thought was a really nice touch. Anyway, moving inside, the building is split into two sections. The left end is exclusive to clothing and accessories, while the right side of the store is where all the food is dumped. The clothing stored here is generally held for the rare outfits such as Undead Survivor gear or those Authentic Z complete outfits. I was also told that Fu will be hosting a community base next wipe if anyone's interested. The wipe is currently ongoing as of June 30th, so if you're up for that, hop on in and give Fu a hand. Alright, it's time to get into the submissions that are eligible for voting. Starting off with one of my personal favorites, this is Ducky and Psycho Bananas Base. If the name sounds familiar, it's because Bananas Base was featured in a short segment in the pilot episode where she had started building a base on that rail car just outside of West Point. Well, her and Ducky decided to take a shot at building their own little town near the West Point mansions. It's filled with a variety of shops and they even managed to keep the original shack that they started out in. I also have some screenshots from them that I'll show at the end if you're interested in seeing some of the progression along the way. Starting out with the first building in line, we have the Laundromat. Nothing too crazy, just a little room to wash your clothes after slaughtering a few thousand zombies. If you notice up on the roof, they have a clothesline and plumbed water barrel for the washing machine below. Heading up the stairs and taking a right, you'll enter the rec room, which consists of two bookcases holding a variety of magazines and skill books, along with a computer and a disc for The Sims 2. There's also a nice little fireplace in the corner for those colder days. Under the rec room is a little doctor's office where the two of them like to test their surgical equipment on the plushies they collect. 
behind the exam room is what seems like a small delivery room, which I thought was pretty cool because I've never seen someone make one of those yet. They even place pillows on the medical beds to fill out the room some more. Heading back downstairs, you can find a hair salon equipped with a variety of hair gels, dyes, and really anything else you need or want. If you're looking for some nice attention to detail, I'd like to draw your attention to the shelf to the north window, where all the bottles up there have been placed manually and color coordinated. Below the hair salon is the snack shack. I think my favorite thing about this place is that each room is completely unique in terms of assets used. Each room has different flooring, different wallpaper, and even different props used, which I thought was really nice. The final building on this strip is clearly Ducky's favorite. The clothing store has a ton of more common clothing you'd find throughout Knox County, but it also has something that not many other players have, an abundance of ballroom dresses for you to sashay around in. If you haven't noticed yet, there's also a massive communal garden in the center of town holding every crop in the game. They placed a nice brick flooring to block sections off and then slapped fencing and flowers down on the perimeter before adding a well in the middle using the More Builds mod. Up next is my favorite aspect of the entire town. This all started from this one little shack that we're walking into. And if you're sitting there saying, but Preds, this is a house, not a shack. Well, as you'll see in the screenshots, this building started as a literal shack. From there, Ducky and Banana went through, knocked out all the walls and removed the flooring, and then rebuilt it from the ground up using custom tiles and more builds and more builds plus. Everything you're seeing from the siding, the flower beds, the walls, this is all hand built by these two. Moving out back, they have a whole patio for barbecuing, equipped with a custom deck that extends into the pond that they're next to. This would normally be enough for a showcase, but we still have a few more buildings to go, so let's hop over to the workshop. Ducky's workshop comes loaded with any crafting item you could possibly need, and once again decorated using custom floor tiles. We use the true metalworking mod, which adds the forge and anvil use he fenced into the center of the room. Upstairs is their general storage area. All of these crates can be crafted and hold 100 storage as opposed to a wooden crate which holds 40. The final building is something that I haven't seen many others do yet, which is to designate a section for a brewery. Inside is a ton of materials needed to brew their own beer and make their own wine using the More Brews mod. To finish off the tour, I was brought to the back of their village, where they had built a small shrine to the Zomboid gods. Strangely enough, this isn't the last time you'll see something like this pop up in this video. I mentioned this a few minutes ago, but Ducky and Banana were kind enough to send over some progress pics of their base throughout their time working on it, so up on screen now is the shack that they started from. The next one is about two in-game months later, once the initial house was built and the safe zone was built out, and the third screenshot here was taken about three months after that, showing the progress they'd made with building out the workshop, which would be the catalyst for the other buildings. You can also see all the logs spread out on the floor, which I can only imagine took countless hours to cut down, bundle up, and saw into planks for use. It's also entirely worth noting that this base was made on the members server, which utilized CDDA zombies and loot respawns set to insanely rare making the game exponentially more difficult. Next up is home to the largest member server faction, the Mean Girls. Built directly at the crossroads, the entire base is walled in using custom texture walls from more builds. It may not sound like much, but the amount of material needed to build out just the walls for the perimeter is nothing short of massive deforestation. We're talking thousands of trees just for the perimeter walls. Directly inside is the gas station, which is open to all players passing through the area. Just beside that is one of their car lots, filled with a variety of military and civilian vehicles, all used for different purposes. Another reminder that this server includes CDDA zombies, so Humvees are an incredibly valuable commodity. Heading inside the clothing store, they've gutted the interior, and we're in the process of building out what I assume is a massive library in here. The faction originally lived here while they built out the rest of their compound that we'll explore. They have a pretty large storage room off to the side here, holding all of their tools and crafting items. They also install these catwalks with guard railings for you to walk to the perimeter and clear out any zombies banging on the gates. It's a nice addition that a lot of people forget to add, so it was cool to see the extra effort go into building out these guardrails so people weren't just falling over the edge. Following the wall leads you to the absolutely massive compound. It scales several floors and, although not entirely finished, is without a doubt the largest project I've ever seen attempted. There's the center room with two grand large staircases that take you up to this library lounge area with matching furniture and flooring. 
Some of the rooms were still under construction at the time that I came to tour, but I would have loved to see the finished product since most of the rooms were all designed to be unique with their own custom wallpaper and props. Heading down the left side is this pretty large strip of rooms the size of normal houses. These are for both faction members to customize and wanderers to stay in while they recover or hide from any exterior threats. This scales for several floors as well, so it's not like they just made a small barracks with 5 or 6 rooms. There's gotta be close to 20 rooms confined to this wing alone. Heading down to the ground floor is where they keep their massive garage. Remember that car lot in the beginning? Well, this is for the custom cars. Each garage has a specific vehicle in it, along with storage and gear belonging to the player that owns that vehicle. These are more decorated than a lot of the bedrooms upstairs since most players spent the majority of their time in this area working on their cars. Heading into the courtyard, you can clearly tell that Barunka decorated it due to the plethora of plants, which I thought was hilarious. Right off the courtyard is a separate garage for trailers so that they didn't clutter the car lot. I really like this idea here since the garage doors are placed on both sides of the building, so you can effectively pull through, drop the trailer off, and then go park your car without having to try and back a trailer in and then get out without slamming into a wall. To the right of the trailers is a bus garage equipped with two buses and a fire truck. Both buses are armored up for maximum protection as well, which I'm sure took a ton of metal to pull off. Another piece here that I thought was pretty funny is the outdoor chapel. It looks like it's still under construction, but a part of me likes to think that the grass is intentional because I honestly think that's a really cool concept. The last piece to show off from this massive base is in Doodle's room. See, the Mean Girls rebranded from the Yellow Jackets last wipe, who were also featured in episode 1. If you remember from them, they had managed to cage a rogue zombie and kept it as a pet, only for it to disappear less than a day before I toured. Well, they came prepared this time, with not one, but two pet zombies. It's gotta be one of the most unique things I've ever seen someone do from an aesthetic perspective, and it reminded me a ton of Bub from Day of the Dead. Before we head over to the public server, there's one last base I want to show off here. Site space may not be the most impressive in terms of beauty, but in terms of defensive builds, it's built to withstand CDDA zombies to a strong extent. For starters, there's no stairs into the base. Everything is accessed via sheet rope, allowing the players to survive indefinitely up on the higher levels. Inside here is two bookshelves containing all skill books and recipe mags, along with a variety of storage sets ranging from weapons to general crafting gear. They managed to decorate the interior with some nice little props like a terrarium, a cat tree, and a globe, all of which I'd never seen in the game before, so that was cool. Heading outside onto the patio, there's a fenced in platform that you can follow that'll take you all the way down to a nearby pond. Zombies aren't able to reach it since it extends down from the second floor directly into the water. From here they have a grill to cook the fish, but they also have several traps and fishing poles ready for use, only amplifying their survivability chances. Heading back inside and up the stairs brings us to the rooftop where the duo has their garden, water barrels, and forge set up. Basically anything that would require some clutter, just throw it on the roof. There's also this really cool maze concept made with crates and stairs at the bottom of the base that's built to confuse and trip up any CDDA zombies, especially brutes, so that they can funnel them into lanes and kill them one at a time instead of trying to fight multiple at once. For anyone who's played CDDA zombies before, you know that running into a brute is basically a death sentence, let alone a dozen. But having something like this that can separate sprinters, screechers, brutes, all of those is a massive advantage. Alright, there's one last piece to show off here, and it's one of those things that probably doesn't seem that exciting at first, until you realize the scale and effort that it must have taken to pull off. Just out of sight from the base is a small path you can take. This leads to a small section of houses, where you can see several staircases stacking on top of each other. After climbing three flights of stairs, you're met with a 1x1 platform that extends off screen. This extends roughly 1100 tiles from this base, all the way to the heart of Maldra. The whole premise being that you can avoid detection from CDDA zombies and have a way to transport gear from looting runs in almost complete safety. Obviously it's incredibly easy to just fall off while walking, but they were in the process of building out the fencing to keep you locked in. I don't think I've seen players attempt something like this before, let alone complete a massive bridge of this scale. The best part is that once you get to your destination, they've also completely walled off a basketball court so you can land in complete safety and scout the surrounding area before leaving for your looting run. Alrighty, it's time to head over to the public server, starting with another one of my personal favorites, the Spiffing Hotel, a project spearheaded by Tabby. Similar to the Mean Girls, the entire perimeter is fenced in, though this was made using vanilla walls. 
The cool part of this is the fact that it was entirely built by one faction member named Matt. So shout out Matt for working on one of the most painstaking parts of the build solo. The ground floor of the entrance building looks like any other warehouse, covered in crates that were used as general storage. In the corner, they have their workbench and a ton of propane tanks. Upstairs is the office room, but that's not where your eyes went to, so let's just move in there. The armory here is impressive, if nothing more than the fact that they took these catwalk crates and built an entire floor using them for the armory crates to stand on. I don't know why, but I love the fact that they did that so you can still see the ground floor while picking out your arsenal. Heading upstairs, there's a mini weapons display showcasing some of the more classy weapons on the server, such as a flamethrower and an M60. I believe this entire section is Tabby's room, which is a nice split compared to what the rest of the hotel looks like. Heading up to the fourth floor, we're greeted with a lounge area that consists of a pool table and some cool lighting. There's some more rooms up here like Acid's room, which is pretty barren, though it was probably still in the works. Matt's room is also up here. It's much more fleshed out and had some nice little extra pieces in it like the piano, the desktop computer, and a table of his favorite weapons. He also had a mannequin holding the complete Spiffo outfit. Another nice touch, but below the mannequin is a small kitchen area with a fridge, a stove, and some cabinets stocked with cooking supplies. Below Matt's room is Crisis room. This one was more of a different approach and had a full living room and dining room setup. They still had their table of favorite guns as well, but they made the decision to move their kitchen into the main section of the room, which I thought was cool and it reminded me a lot of like a tight apartment. Inside the actual bedroom was where they kept the few crates and water barrels for personal use. I didn't do the best job of showing this, but there's also this large sky deck across the main roads so that players drove under it, serving as a marker for the Spiffing Hotel. There's one more floor above us, but it was completely empty, so I decided to skip it for time's sake and showcase the entire build from the rooftop. One thing we didn't get to explore, however, was the guard tower to the north of the hotel. It's this massive hand-built tower overlooking the entire hotel, which I thought was just incredible to see. Alright, this one's a bit of a switch up, but still one I wanted to show off, if nothing more than the fact that they're a new Project Zomboid player, and I was impressed with what they were able to do with zero help. This is Wingnut's first time playing Project Zomboid, and they went with a risky base sitting just outside of Louisville. They added a few airlock gates to a construction zone and began building out a custom building with a brick house exterior. There's space for a small crafting zone, but the big eye popper for me was the weapons room next door. Inside was a pretty filled out collection of firearms and explosives from Britta's weapon bag that I was fairly impressed with. For those that don't know, a lot of the weapons shown here spawn in some of the more dangerous POIs in the game, so as a brand new player, they would have had to walk into something like the Louisville Checkpoint, deal with hundreds of zombies in the area, loot everything, and make it back here without dying multiple times. Just outside of the trailer is a campfire, water barrel, and several cooking pots to sterilize bandages and make food with. They also built a well next to a small garden section over in the corner. Inside, the bookshelves are stocked with recipe magazines and skill books, all major requirements, especially as a solo runner. It's not some massive skyscraper housing dozens of players, but I still wanted to show this off because I just thought it was really sweet to see a brand new player take a shot at this game and actually do a pretty good job at it. Moving over to Lake Ivy, we have Ding Dong's Lakeside Mansion. Now, a quick disclaimer here, there's a ton of custom flooring here that they built this massive parking lot on, but obviously with the snow here, you can't see it, which kind of sucks. So I just wanted to make a quick point that even with all the work that's put into this one, there's even more that's going to go completely unnoticed. It's a big reason why the cars are positioned the way that they are, and there's a lot of them. Off the parking lot is a small shed where they kept Badger, who I think is another player on the server. I don't know, but this is also where they keep all of their crafting stuff, if you couldn't tell. There's also some random car parts in here as well, which I'm assuming they did just to keep the exterior looking clean. Moving inside the house, the ground floor was reconverted into a garage to hold even more vehicles and car parts. Heading upstairs, you can walk into their living room that's been completely overrun with stuffed animals and plushies. Next to the stairs is a crate of key rings that the group had gathered from fallen players throughout the wipe. There's gotta be at least a hundred keys here, which is absolutely crazy to think of all the dead players they've come across. Moving over to the kitchen, there's a pretty intense party going on with some more stuffed animals, and I don't know why, but I can't shake this feeling that I'm missing out on a really good time here. The third floor was also pretty entertaining. They got this little rec room hangout area with some kids mats and a slide that I'm assuming they stole from a playground. Across from the slide is an arcade room encapsulated with these glass windows that allow you to look out and admire the view from almost anywhere in the room. 
After saying hi to Boris, we headed upstairs to one of the more unnerving rooms I've ever walked into. Next to this haunted room is Lainai's bedroom, because where else would you want to sleep if not next to a dozen dead bodies? The room itself is really well decorated and comes equipped with its own camera for, um, for things. The next floor up is more of a green room, covered head to toe in various plants. I always love rooms like this because it's so cool to see people collecting all these plants that I feel like always get passed over for paintings and other stuff like that. Alright, I've lost track of what floor we're on at this point. I think it's the fifth floor, maybe? I don't know, and you probably don't even care. But what's cool about this room is that they built a giant dance floor and decorated mannequins with the rare complete outfits from Undead Survivors and the authentic Z sets. On the opposite end of the room, there's also at least 20 big scalibers, which, if you don't know, may be the best weapon in the game. On the roof, they have this platform that you can climb up to and grab this sick aerial shot of the entire base, so this is what it looks like from its final form. Now I want to make a quick pit stop in Rosewood, because there's another incredibly interesting setup. There's no massive base or some crazy outlandish design. Instead, Lady Plays decided to take the gated community in Rosewood and turn it into a complete sanctuary for new players. The entire neighborhood is open to the public, meaning nothing is safe house claimed which would prevent players from entering. Inside some of the homes are bookshelves stocked with every single skill book and recipe magazine to give new players a good start. Heading out back, there's also dozens of gas cans for players to take and use, along with water barrels for you to restock your bottles with. The garage has a workbench inside with all the materials needed to craft your own armor, along with seeds to start a garden with, and a variety of vehicle parts to fix up your car. Across the street is another building with a ton of materials for players to take and use, along with a second floor for them to rest and recover at. There's also a ton of weapons up here to take and use, and spots to leave gear to restock. Just outside of this building is one of my favorite inventions. This is specific to Rosewood, but throughout the city, there's a couple setups just like this, where water barrels are placed above a sink and then plumbed, effectively creating a drinking fountain available to the public. This allows any player to come by, wash your clothes, refill your water bottles, and then move on. The bar across the street has the same premise as well, but a lot of it is repeated. This is just something I found really cool, especially with the fact that this just survived an entire wipe without anyone griefing it or destroying it. Just a sanctuary for new players to gear up, farm some skills, and grab a car before moving on to their next adventure. Back in the cold again, welcome to Trog City, an entire faction built city made from scratch. This faction has unfortunately disbanded since this recording, but it's still worth showcasing because I like the idea that they built an absolutely massive city from scratch. At the time of recording, this was the largest faction on the public server, containing over 20 players, which is nuts to me. I'm not going to go into major detail because there's so many buildings, but we'll start with Mod's house first. We've got a weapon storage room in his front walkway and a garage in the back. Upstairs is the kitchen area with the walls being made entirely out of glass. Most of the rooms are still under construction, but the layout is fully built. Next door is another player's house. This one was unique to the rest of the city because they gutted the entirety of their ground floor to use as a garage. The only way to move between floors is via sheet rope. There's no stairs. To move through the base, you can go to the top floor, and then take another sheet rope down to the second floor, where they built out a kitchen, living room, and general storage area. Inside the Holy Haven Cemetery building is the faction's main storage room. This is the only existing building in the entire city, meaning everything that you've seen up until this, and every building you'll see for the remainder of the city tour, was built entirely by players. Here's what the interior looks like. Much like any other storage room, they've got an insane amount of gas and propane, along with a massive plushy collection on display. The storage building is also a mini base of sorts, coming with its own lounge and kitchen area. In the center of the building is the main weapon storage, which is openly accessible to any player in the faction. It's loaded with hundreds of guns and thousands of boxes of ammo, including some of the rare melee weapons, such as an obsidian knife and an antique katana. Next to the cemetery is yet another player base. 
I like this one a lot just due to the display setup they had on the second floor where they grabbed jewelry cases and threw a ton of jewelry into it. If you aren't aware, we use an economy mod to convert jewelry into cash, so this is the extent of flexing your cash for the world to see. I want to note as well that there's a dozen or so buildings that are either partially finished or just random complete buildings that no one claimed. These are all from players in the faction who had left the faction throughout the wipe before finishing their builds, so that's what you're seeing here. Among those buildings is a full replica Spiffo restaurant. Basically, they recreated a one-to-one -one scale model of a Spiffo restaurant like you'd see while exploring Knox County. The only difference is that they built this from scratch in-game. Oh, and on the second floor, they had this giant ritual room for their self-proclaimed cult of Spiffo. There's also this absolutely massive unfinished mansion that one of the players, KMA, had been building out. It's not furnished, but the foundation is insane and reminded me a ton of Fu's mansion from the first episode. The last building that I want to show off from here is this absolutely massive tower, also built by KMA. There's a full-fledged garage and storage section on the ground floor, and the second floor is KMA's apartment building, fully decorated and filled with various items, including a complete library. The third floor is a restaurant. It comes with a full dining section with tables and chairs for people to eat at, along with a bar players can sit at. He also took the time to build out two bathrooms. Up on the fourth floor is like a hotel floor of sorts. It's got several rooms that players are able to crash in during their stay here. Our tour guide mods explain that some of the newer players ended up moving in here while they worked on their own houses. Floors five, six, and seven are planned out, but nothing is built on them, unfortunately. Overall, this entire seven story building was planned, built, and furnished by one sole player, KMA. An absolutely mind-blowing amount of work if you think about it, even just in terms of how many logs and planks would be needed for something like this that would take dozens of hours just to gather. Mods was kind enough to send over a picture of the base layout for those of you who are interested in that. I'll throw that up on screen now for you. Heading to the opposite end of the map, we have Normal Onion's Lakeside Mansion. This one-man mansion is one of my favorite solo player builds in this video, if nothing more for the fact that everything is decorated with the same style. The windows are all evenly placed, all the colors match, it's just a really solid build through and through. Heading in through the garage, there's a metal grate set up with four parking spots. He's got a souped up truck in the main slot with a built garbage can behind it to toss any damaged parts he's swapping out. Behind the cars is Onion's crafting station, stocked with six crates, a workbench, and what I believe is an ammo press used to craft your own bullets. Taking the side door from the crafting room leads to a small waiting area with another set of doors and a staircase. Behind the second door is a small shooting range along with a crate containing 60 units of human blood. Don't ask. Heading back to the waiting room, you can access a small lounge equipped with a bar, pool table, and popcorn machine. Heading upstairs brings us to the living quarters. There's a small middle room that all the others are built off of that's covered in various plants and art pieces which I thought was pretty neat. Up here is a kitchen with a built out island. There's also some gems here like the pinball machine, a calendar, and a coffee maker. Onion also prepared a final meal before wipe day that I thought was fitting. To the right of the kitchen is Onion's living room. The plushies hold all the couch space, leaving spots on the bench press or treadmill for you to sit. Directly behind the living room is his general weapon storage. He's got some weapons on display and even more stored in the lockers. The third floor is reserved for Onion's bedroom, office, and private bathroom. The bedroom is pretty cool though. He used two desks and built them together to make one larger desk using two pieces for that middle section. Behind his bedroom is the personal office, fully stocked with every skill book and magazine on the server, along with some bourbon and cigarettes for those rainy days. One last piece to touch on up here. If you head to the corner of his bedroom, there's a sheet rope that you can slide down that takes you down into the weapon storage. There's a door here that you can open which gives you access to the machine guns on the side table while preventing any zombies from reaching you since they're boxed in. A really smart defensive move for whenever your house gets sieged. 
Moving outside, there's this whole other river section completely separate from the main base. It's entirely fenced in so zombies can't get to it and includes a variety of buildings. To start, he's got a guest house equipped with food, water, skill books, magazines, and VHS tapes for them to utilize. There's a small boxed off room to the west that holds zombie Jesus in it. The coolest part of this section comes at the far end of the build where a massive lighthouse sits. Not only was all this built from scratch by one person, but the lighthouse is even decorated on each floor. Keeping the trend of solo player builds, I moved to Blackbeard's base. This is another beauty that's very well designed and decorated. We chose to start in the living area since it's more extensive compared to the garage. In the main entrance there's this triple line staircase, but the rooms on the side are where your eyes went to so let's go through them. In the corner is a nice little bar. It's smaller than some of the other ones we've seen, but I also don't think this base is built to have absolutely massive rooms like some of the other ones we've walked through. The same can be said with the office space and library. They're very well decorated with the walls covered in pictures and flags, along with using custom tiles for the flooring to make them feel very different from each other. Moving upstairs, Blackbeard built out a kitchen and dining area for players to eat at, along with a full rec room. My favorite part of this setup is that they went and built on the top of the garage, but it still feels like the garage is its own section of the base. I don't know why I like that so much, but it just made everything feel like it had its own place in the building. Above the garage is the weapons room and general storage. The third floor has a ton of rain barrels, with rooms up here set aside for gardens. Overall, another fantastic single player base that's fully decorated and furnished, with a complete build to surround it. Down to our final two bases of the showcase, we're going to make a quick pit stop in Louisville. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to coordinate a time with this faction, but it's still pretty cool, so I wanted to show it off quick. Essentially, they took over an apartment complex in the middle of the most dense city in the game. After fencing in the ground floor with gates and welding the doors and windows shut, they gutted the ground floor and transformed it into a giant vehicle storage. The access to the second level is accessible via sheet rope to keep players safe when they log off. Though every other floor has staircase access since zombies can't reach up here. Each apartment of the building is reserved for a player in the faction for them to decorate as they see fit. With that covered, let's head up to the third floor to showcase my favorite part of the base. I don't know why, but this is so cool to me. The hallway is lined with freezers for food storage, there's a command center, a workout room, a bar for you to relax in which uses red light bulbs to set the mood, There's some more bedrooms up here, but on the east end of the floor is their absolutely massive weapons room. They have various guns on display, but the walls are lined top to bottom with crates, full of more guns, and thousands of boxes of ammo. Overall, it's a brilliant idea that was executed incredibly well given how difficult this area is for the first six months or so of the wipe. Last but not least, we're going to take a stop at Noxix Base, also conveniently located in Louisville. The entry is an open parking lot where most of their vehicles are stored, with an overflow section in the back for their semis. Their garden area is really nicely laid out in rows separated for each crop. Heading inside, you're greeted with a general crafting location. They've got 15 crates that are loaded with different types of materials, all needed for late game gear and weapons. There's some other rooms like a small medical bay, but there's cooler stuff to show off upstairs. The second floor has a variety of rooms crammed into it for us to explore, starting with the kitchen. 
just outside of this is a small lounge complete with all the skill books vhs tapes and magazines that you'd ever need each bedroom is assigned to and decorated by one player from the faction which i always like because it allows players to add their own personal flair to the base i really like the hallway decorations here as well they used two different tiles for the flooring and then lined the wall with alternating pictures, cabinets, and plants. Off of the hallway is the main kitchen. Across from this kitchen is the faction armory. There's dozens of crates in here containing everything from scrap weapons to MG42s and rocket launchers. The rec room is a staple in every base, and it's no different here, complete with all the gear you'd want to relax with, such as bourbon, cigarettes, TVs, pool tables, if you name it, they've got it. The third floor greets you with Noxix Arming Chamber. They've got some of their favorite guns out on display, including a straight up minigun. This entire floor is essentially Noxic and Diet Water's living quarters. Right off of the weapon arming station is the main bedroom, which also has a nice little M240 sitting on the coffee table for everyone to stare at as they walk in. Behind the laundry room is Diet Water's room and storage. It's not as decorated and it was clearly still under construction, but I like the color scheme that they were trying to pull off along with the tiled flooring that they added. To end off the tour, they took me across this massive air bridge that sits over one of the main roads in Louisville. This was designed to be a noob starting area to help players get geared up and out into the world relatively quickly. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough time to finish it, though the sentiment was really nice to see. This was the first wipe where we had multiple factions and players actively engaging in builds like this to try and help new players out some more. Whether it's a shelter like this, or something like what Lady Plays did in Rosewood, I just thought that was really cool to see so many people being so welcoming. And with that, we've reached the end of PZ Cribs episode 2. Don't forget to leave a comment with your favorite build from the video. The winner will receive a golden hammer during the next wipe, along with a free cargo shipment to help them with their next build. A friendly reminder that our public server is free to join and open to everyone, so if you're interested in playing, just head on over to our Discord and grab the PZ server role to hop in. A massive thank you to my YouTube members and Patreon supporters, who are the reason we even have servers like this to begin with. I appreciate you all, and as always, thanks for stopping by.